So am I magnified? Am I fine? Do you need it for the recording? So I'm, I'm good. Good. Perfect. All right. If you can't hear at the back, like just wave your hand or something, I can talk louder. But for now, you can hear at the back? Good. Thank you. So um, as Paula knows, I never, I never read papers. I always tell students they should never read papers. I always use PowerPoint. I'm not using PowerPoint. I am reading a paper. I apologize a little bit for doing that because I have reasons for telling students they should never do it. But I have reasons for doing it this way. The most important one is if there's a moral of this paper, it's that silence has to be listened to carefully. And I want you to listen. So I'm reading the paper. This essay distinguishes two forms of silence. The silence that makes rhythm possible and the silence of loss and longing. The first makes a space for rituals and their ability to construct the world through regular repetition. The second echoes the untold and untellable stories that lie beneath both social life and language itself. It argues that both, as they intertwine, are crucial parts of human experience and traces their destruction and recuperation in a case of overnight urbanization in China. Silence, as I will discuss, is thus not just the absence of speech, but a necessary part of all the rhythms of life, not replaced, but invoked by speech. The ethnographic data come from the eastern edge of Suzhou, a wealthy city in China's southern Jiangsu province. Over the past two decades, the city has rapidly resettled the entire rural population of most of five townships. That's roughly 100,000 people to clear space for an upscale new urban region that's now home to roughly a million. The old rural population has been resettled in new apartment complexes that were built for them. They live quite close to where their ancestors had lived, but their houses, farms, temples, and graves have been obliterated, as have their old political institutions of villages and townships. The bulldozers that ended their old way of life forever also buried the rhythms and longings of that life. This is the story of that loss and of the ways those people are reclaiming the dual worlds of silence and its rhythms. But before I turn to Suzhou, I want to illustrate these two forms of silence with a story from an utterly different context, emergency surgery at a hospital in a large American city. So this is the story of the surgeon and an unnamed man. Someone knew the unnamed man's name, but not his surgeon, whom I will call Kay. Kay would normally make a real effort to know something about her patients as individuals. But now, there was no time for such things. The unnamed man had been rushed from the emergency room to the nearby trauma bay with a gunshot wound. The bullet had enters, entered his abdomen, pierced through a lung, entered one side of the heart, and left through the other side. He still lived, though, so the surgeons would do everything they could. The man must have had friends and relatives, a life as full of joy and grief as any of us. He had stories of his own, including the tale of how he came to be shot. The people in the trauma bay knew none of this, though. Whatever hope they had for his life depended completely on their speed. There was no time for any story except the one the bullet told, the narrative arc of abdomen, lung, Heart. When Kay is on call for traumas, she favors sneakers, not just because they're comfortable while standing for hours doing surgery, but because when the call comes, she'll drop whatever she's doing and run at full speed through the hospital to the trauma bay. A trauma bay is not a full operating room. Instead, it's an emergency space for dealing with unfolding crises. In a case like this, where the man's life was disappearing by the second. There may not even be time to sterilize properly, certainly no time for the niceties of proper operating rooms, like putting little booties on your shoes to avoid contamination. 
The surgeons are proud of how quickly they can mechanically replace the blood flow in the body <clears throat> and how quickly they can pry open the ribs to get at the blasted heart. Kay needed to close each bullet hole with just two perfectly placed sutures, as small as possible to avoid damaging the heart any further. Each had to be tied down tight enough to close the wound, but not so tight that it would break. All this on a moving heart, while taking pains to avoid the major nerve running up its side and as quickly as, could, as she could between the bursts of blood that spouted from the bullet holes every few seconds. Finally, it was finished. The rhythmic wheeze and groan of the heart-lung machine stopped and Kay massaged the heart, trying to get it to beat in an organized rhythm again. She took a moment to marvel at the heart she held in her hands. And Kay ended the story there. She'd been telling various stories of life as a surgical resident and of the excitement of taking on more and more responsibility. This was the first time she had been the one to hold a heart, to try to squeeze it back into the rhythms of life. She showed little interest in telling the other stories, the unnamed man's life and how he came to be shot, which had never been to, told to her either. The aspects of the trauma bay too technical for us to understand or too routine for her to notice, even whether he lived or died. All of that could remain silent. Those of us listening, though, we pressed her for more. She sighed. She said, usually with trauma surgery, they already know what will happen. Sometimes the patient's already dead. Sometimes the doctors can see that nothing is possible, although, of course, they'll still try as hard as they can. The rest of the time, they're confident that they can help. But this guy, she said, this guy. She massaged and shocked his heart, and it beat. Lub dub, as first one pair of valves and then the other pair closed to move the blood through the heart and the body, followed by the silence of the resting phase. That resting phase must have felt endless as everyone in the room waited to see if there would be a second beat to break the silence. And it beat again and again, and then it was four and five and six beats. The crowded trauma bay filled with hope. He was shot through the heart. Had they really saved him? They had not. The sixth was the final beat that heart would take. The anticipatory silence of its resting phase stretched on until the rhythm was broken and hope was lost. People die. We all die. The surgeons and the nurses know this well. Those six beats of impossible hope, though, made this one so much harder. So amid all that din of a trauma bay, there are two silences that I want to discuss as a way of leading into this Sujo case. The rhythm of heartbeats and the silence of stories, both told and not told. The resting phase of every heartbeat is a silence. The unnamed man had only six of these during the operation, and that only if we include the final one, the one that never ended. But many other heartbeats are implied, his own before he was shot. The hearts of the doctors, the nurses, and the support staff in the room. My heart, your hearts. Those rhythms are crucial to the functioning of the body. They keep the four chambers of the heart coordinated so that blood, oxygen, and nutrients can flow continuously through the body. Other kinds of rhythms are also keys to coordination, both biological and social. We cannot dance together without rhythm. We cannot march together arrhythmically. Even two people walking together tend unconsciously to coordinate their steps. Those rhythms, like heartbeats, also contain silences between each footstep or between beats as we clap along to some tune. All rhythm relies on silence or at least on the contrast between one state and another. Lub dub, silence, lub dub, silence. Natural rhythms, like heartbeats, are not metronomic, but they vary from moment to moment. Nevertheless, they come at more or less predictable intervals. That's the difference between rhythm and ordinary repetition. Rhythm thus gives us a shared temporality, an expectation of a shared future, as well as a repeated past. Rhythm is not just a recollection of past repetitions, but an expectation of future ones. 
these contributions of rhythmic repetition to help us coordinate and to give us a sense of shared past and future help explain why ritualization is such an important process almost everywhere. All ritual repeats in the sense that it has an internal rhythm of sequences and timing that participants typically know in advance. Much is also rhythmic in the sense that it repeats predictably, either following natural cycles, the sun and the sky, the seasons, the phases of the moon, or by creating its own purely conventional time, like the seven-day week marked by the Sabbath. Such rituals are heartbeats on a grand social scale, and like all rhythms, they require a phase change to mark time, ritual time and ordinary time, tick and talk the active phase of the heartbeat, and the resting phase. Silence, that is, is built into the idea of rhythm and thus of our social lives together. <clears throat> that is, this is why waiting for the seventh heartbeat of the gunshot victim was so painful, and perhaps why Kay was initially silent about it. The rhythm of the first six heartbeats had set up an expectation for the future, not just for the next heartbeat and the one after that, but for life in its full social sense. The absence of a seventh heartbeat, the breaking of rhythms, temporality, and hope brings us to the second silence in the story, the one of loss and longing. The silence of God after disaster strikes is perhaps the most extreme version of this yearning to overcome an, impo an impassable gulf of silence. And the death of an unnamed man is just one of many kinds of such silence. This problem has been much discussed, but perhaps no one put it better than Rumi, the 13th century Sufi poet. One of his stories tells of a man who constantly prayed. He prayed, called out the name of Allah. But the devil appeared to him one night. And the devil said, where is the answer, here am I, to all this Allah of yours? No, not one answer is coming from the throne. How long are you going to grimly go on crying Allah? And the man felt that the devil was right. He was disheartened by the silence of God in the face of all his devotion. So the man stopped praying. In a dream, though, the mystical guide Hazir appeared to speak for Allah and says to the man, said to the man, your cry of Allah is itself my here am I. Your pleading and agony and fervor is my messenger. Under each Allah of yours whispers many a here am I. For Rumi, the yearning itself is the answer. God's silence is thus not an absence, but part of a rhythm. Every repetition of Allah alternates with a silent here am I, and a relationship is established, a heartbeat. Maybe we can push this a step farther as well. The silence actually is broken when Allah through Khazir, but of course also through Rumi, when Allah explains how yearning and silence work together. That is, the speaking of Rumi itself invokes and shapes the silence and creates the rhythm. This dynamic, I will suggest, characterizes Kay's story as well, along with the Sujo cases I'll discuss in a minute. Rumi's solution to the problem of God's silence as a rhythmic response rather than complete absence put silence in a different light from what some of the recent academic literature conveys. That literature sometimes associates silence above all with moments of trauma, with the excesses beyond what an ordinary life should bear. As Carol Kidron discusses, earlier versions of that idea promoted speech as a way of helping people to overcome periods of trauma, which she calls the logocentric paradigm of silence. In that literature, silence is a problem, and narration is the solution. Much the same point was made by Harry England in a study of post-war traumas in Mozambique. He says, discursive therapy based on verbalized expressions of experience, which had been promoted by the NGOs there, is incompatible with central concerns in Mozambican refugees' own methods of dealing with stressful events which center instead on non-discursive modes, like ritual. We can see other versions of the logocentric paradigm, for example, when people criticize silence as a form of complicity 
implying that the only proper positioning requires speech. Later authors, like Vina Das on ordinary ethics, and certainly including Kidron and England, made clear that the silence itself needed to be honored and is as much a part of the process of getting on with life as witnessing and narrating. Das comes especially close to Rumi's understanding when she writes of how, it's a quote again, the antiphony of language and silences recreates the world in the face of tragic loss. Although these authors focus on trauma, that sense of loss is built into all life, not just moments of trauma. Every story we tell leaves alternative stories untold. Thus, Kay's initial choice not to narrate the death of her patient cannot simply be written off as her unhappiness with the outcome. Even after she told the continuation of the story, multitudes of stories, potential stories, remained untold or untellable. The continuation itself made even more palpable the silence of that seventh heartbeat that never came. Every anthropologist is deeply familiar with this, the way so much of our experience in the field remains buried in our field notes or was never recorded in, in the first place, the way the stories we choose to tell so often seem askew from the stories the people themselves might tell and not tell themselves, the way we choose not to tell some stories at all, the way the act of telling conjures up all of the untold. Every utterance does the same thing as the words we did not choose lurk behind the ones we spoke. This was Derrida's point when he wrote that, a quote again, silence plays the irreducible role of that which bears and haunts language, outside and against which alone language can emerge. So no language without silence. Those silences of loss and yearning are thus not the unique products of trauma, but stem from each word we utter and every action we take. Silence, that is, is never simply the absence of speech, as if speech was the normal, healthy expectation and silence constituted its lack. In its present absence, silent is not a blank slate, while meaning is the province only of speech. Quite the opposite, in a sense, silence is filled with multitudes of potential meanings, but refuses to resolve, simplify, and unify those meanings. Is someone's silence to be taken as acquiescence, complicity, resistance, sulkiness, distraction, indecision, incomprehension, or perhaps rejection of the very frames of speech? As long as the silence continues, everything remains possible. It's possible to break the silence, of course, by explaining what one meant or by imposing an interpretation on someone else's silence. That act, however, attempts to strip silence of its complexity and at the same time reminds us of the underlying silence. Thus, it was Kay's continuation of her story after her initial silence that invoked all the silences, especially the death of the unnamed man. Similarly, it was the devil and then Hazir speaking, their speaking, that shaped and amplified the silence of God. The silence and the speech constitute each other. Death and horrific trauma, of course, carry the possibility of complete annihilation, potentially breaking the antiphony of words and silences. The call and response with silence leaves us with a constant feeling of yearning for the absent, but at least we can keep calling. Annihilation is such a different silence from the antiphonal one that perhaps it deserves a different word. Let me call it the abyss. There is no antiphony in the abyss. There is no rhythm at all, and so none of the sense of time that rhythm creates. No past, no future. It's the black hole of social life from which no signal escapes. The abyss is where most of human life eventually ends, when the last person who remembers your name is herself long forgotten. Most deaths and most traumas do not throw us down the abyss, although they certainly offer us a glimpse of its depths. We have many ways to reanimate the dead, remembering them and memorializing them, or seeing their ghosts and speaking to their spirits. That is, the sense of loss and longing may never go away. 
but we can still reestablish the rhythms of life, its antiphonal calls and responses. Sometimes this push against the utter entropy of the abyss can go on for many centuries. It's the case with some of the deities who appear in what follows. Sometimes it may be no more than the generation who holds a personal memory. But one way or the other, a rhythm with silence is recreated each time. The rhythm and the yearning go together, even though they entail such different relationships to time, to desire, and to subjectivity. Listen to a Billie Holiday song, to the way she often seems to come in just after the beat. She makes us anticipate, just for a moment, but it's enough to give the music much of its power. Every little rhythmic delay, every tiny extension of the silence, deepens the sense of longing that characterizes many of her songs. Periods of terrible trauma, of death and disaster, break the rhythm and risk the abyss. Over the course of human history, much has been lost down that pit. Nevertheless, we can often manage to reclaim silence and its rhythms, even if the sense of loss never goes away. The rest of this essay looks at the destruction of a social world and the ways people are trying to reestablish the rhythms of life by dealing with the dead and their longing for the lost. So, to Sudo now, this section is called From Rhythm to Loss with Bulldozers. For the sake of brevity, let me begin in the 1990s, when people in this part of China were finally accustomed to the decollectivized agriculture and market reforms that had taken hold a decade earlier. I'll end it in this section with the bulldozers that began flattening my field site in the following decade. Most of my information comes from two neighboring rural townships that no longer exist. They're called Chefang and Xietang. In the 1990s, both were part of the far rural periphery of the wealthy city of Suzhou. Typically for the region, they were home to a couple of small towns and a few dozen administrative villages. The 1980s and 90s had seen construction of the first network of roads. This area is in the Yangtze River Delta, an enormous wetland, and so nearly all transportation before then had been by boat. The villages were laid out along the canals and streams, and every household owned at least one boat. When asked if they missed anything about those buried villages, people today often speak wistfully of how people used to go visit friends in the evenings, Chuanmen in Chinese literally means to thread the, thread the doorways together. They would walk from one house to another. Most say they might occasionally stay in touch with those people now by social media, but that kind of rural visiting is gone. That is, especially after the end of cooperative agriculture in the early 1980s, and up until the bulldozers came in the 2000s, the rhythms of mutual visiting became one of the most important forces to enhance social networks within villages. Other rhythms of village life were more ritualized. Some of these included the annual occasions that people share across the entire Chinese world, like the Lunar New Year, uh, whose secular aspects the state has long endorsed as Spring Festival. Others, where the presence of spirits was harder to ignore, had no state blessing during the Maoist period, but their public performance began to recover during the economic reforms and political loosening of the 1980s. Beginning in 2008, China ended the national week-long holiday around International Labor Day and reinstituted three from that traditional lunar calendar, Qingming, when people care for the tombs of their ancestors, Duanwu, when you race the dragon boats, and the Mid-Autumn Festival. All of these follow the phases of the lunar calendar and involve families burning incense and making offerings to ancestors. The villagers of Chafang and Xietang were no exceptions. More locally, villagers here began to rebuild temples in the early 1980s, almost immediately after the Cultural Revolution ban on public worship began to fade away. This happened differentially in many parts of China, so the particular patterns vary widely. In this region, Temple reconstruction was almost always led by what the local people called incense heads, xiangtou in Chinese, many of whom also serve as spirit mediums or pilgrim and or pilgrimage organizers. Either gender can serve in this role, 
although there's certainly more women now. In either case, followers acknowledge the person to be closer to the deities than most other people. Such people could mobilize their charisma to organize their village neighbors, to contribute money and labor, to build small temples. Most of the villages had at least one of these temples, usually in a modest building, not very visible from the road. This was because local governments have periodically torn temples down for housing what they call feudal superstition, even after the end of the Cultural Revolution. With little capital needed to rebuild, however, the temples usually sprouted up again quite quickly. These, tip, these, temples typically, <laughs> these temples typically came to life in accordance with the rhythms of the moon. Those occasions included all the major holidays of the year, along with the first and 15th of each lunar month, the days of the new moon and the full moon. On those days, many people would come to burn incense at the temple, sometimes making specific requests to the deities, like help my daughter get a good grade on the exam next week, that kind of thing, or often just wishing for general peace and prosperity. A spirit medium usually sat there as well, especially early in the morning when most people came. She, sometimes he, was available so that her deity could provide direct advice to people. The rhythm thus followed moments of transition between yin and yang, the day when the moon reached its maximum size and began to shrink, uh, yin at its peak and yang begins to grow, um, and the one when it disappeared and began to grow again. Worship on the lunar 1st and 15th created a standard pattern of one day of communication with the spirits and two weeks of quiet, an active phase and a resting phase, if you will. The pattern could occasionally be interrupted, as when we say our heart skips a beat. For instance, someone's illness might have required an urgent consultation with the deity, or a deity might possess someone to make demands, build me a temple. The overall rhythm, though, would quickly resume. These rhythmic flows still continue in nearby rural areas that were not urbanized. They ended in Xietang and most of Chafang, however, when the bulldozers came in the early 2000s. China and Singapore had agreed in 1994 to develop the rural areas of eastern Suzhou into a new mixed-use development intended to attract China's rising new middle class and the kinds of high-end economic activities that such people would bring. Its official title of Suzhou Industrial Park, SIP, they always call it SIP in English, is thus something of a misnomer because it also includes large residential and commercial areas. Many other rapidly expanding cities, including Beijing and Guangzhou, had followed a model of, in Chinese, what they call villages within cities, Chanzhongchun, uh, in which rural villages were engulfed by urban development but they were left intact as political units. They often retained some kinds of communal resources, including some control over land. The government of the SIP chose a more radical path. They erased the villages and townships completely and replaced them with urban categories of street committees and urban districts. With just a very few exceptions of historically important structures, everything else was flattened and buried. All the physical structures, houses, graves, temples, irrigation canals, agricultural fields, plus all the social and political structures, like township and village governments, all flattened. As one village after another fell beneath the bulldozers, its people were scattered into multi-story apartment complexes, housing thousands of people each, which serve as mini ghettos for the resettled population within the much more upscale development of the new urban zone. Now constituting a minority of about 10% of the local population, the original village residents live in some isolation from the coffee shops, high-end malls, and expensive apartments of the outsiders who have flooded in. The bulldozers buried all those rhythms of village life that I just discussed, along with the physical infrastructure that enabled and materialized them. Even the daily rhythms of agriculture were gone, as middle-aged and older farmers now faced unemployment, except sometimes at the very bottom of the hierarchy, cleaning streets, recycling old metal, doing piecework at home, sometimes serving as unskilled security guards. 
with no temples and no nearby graves, the broader ritual rhythms were gone as well. So now, from longing for that loss, back to rhythm, with garages this time instead of bulldozers. The bulldozers have pushed noisily, noisily from north to south across the five townships. The resulting blank slate was quickly redrawn so that the erased villages, temples, and irrigation canals have been replaced by high-rise apartments, upscale shopping malls, new university campuses, and all the other features of a modern middle-class city as imagined by urban planners. Even the remaining streams now run in a grid pattern. Really, they, if I were to use a PowerPoint, I would show you the Google Earth image. They're really in a grid. Of the hundreds of village temples that had existed, only one survived, a large earth god temple that was preserved because it allegedly dates from the southern Song dynasty from about 800 years ago, along with an ancient stone bridge that it guards. Suzhou, however, has pioneered an unusual policy. Rather than simply wiping out people's temple lives completely, which is what you would think from looking at national policy, the city has often allowed people to house statues of their gods inside very large temples run either by the, du the Buddhist or the Taoist Association of China. To our knowledge, uh, our, because there's a co-author here, this happened first in the city, or a co-researcher, first in the city god temple of Suzhou, right in the middle of the historical center of Suzhou city when it reopened in 2004. It still houses a large selection of deities from villages and neighborhoods that no longer exist. And people from those villages still come to burn incense on the 1st and 15th of each lunar month. These statues are relegated to side altars, but their very existence is unusual in the Chinese context. Buddhist temples in the area sometimes serve the same function. The SIP decided to follow a similar strategy, and one of the Taoists who had been involved in the city god temple helped them design a plan for five brand new Taoist temples that would house all the local gods. Only two of those, two of those were actually built, um, but in fact, both feature statue after statue of deities who had been worshipped in villages. So if you know Chinese religion, it's a very unusual structure for a Chinese temple. The earth god temple that was preserved also now houses many of those statues, that is, the ones rescued from village temples. The temple we know best, my co-researcher and I, um, stands in the far south of the SIP and contains deities from the ex Chefang township and part of Xietang. The Taoists who run that temple felt that the original statues from the village temples were far too small, far too dirty, far too primitive to be placed in the new temple. Everything was thus re-carved to a standard size and style. The original statues, well over a thousand of them, according to some local informants, were buried. The Taoists standardized the names of the deities by researching the real name, the real name of each god, as they put it. They also scoffed at the idea, strongly promoted by many of the villagers, that each village should have its own deity represented, even if it was the same god as somebody else's. The Taoist in charge said, don't these peasants understand that there's only one Sui Liang Wang, who was one of the local gods, there's only one Sui Liang Wang, only one Meng Jiang. There's no reason to have more than one altar for each. Just that one decision, though, just that one decision shows how utterly different this situation is from the older pattern of village life materialized in a temple and its rituals. Deities have now been detached from the villages as social units. Taoist rationalization, just like urban planning rationalization, had no interest in preserving the social world that had been buried. Nevertheless, that world has not been content with simple silence. I don't mean that they actively protest. Protests against resettlement are common, actually, in China, and there's a significant literature on them. Some took place here as well, although they're not especially vocal. For my purposes, they offer little theoretical insight into the linked problems of silence, loss, and rhythm. Instead, 
I'm referring to the way people have been a able, to some extent, to establish new rhythms of sociality by reworking both the new resettlement apartment complexes and the temple. All the resettlement apartments have concrete basement storage areas, which people refer to as garages, chaku, even though a car couldn't actually drive into them. Some people park motorbikes there, but most of the space is used flexibly, from storage to extra living space. With village temples now impossible, many spirit mediums have chosen to turn their garages into private altars. As a guess, there may be about 60 to 100 of these spread over the two large sets of resettlement apartment complexes in what used to be the two townships. These altars do not just replace parts of village religious life. They replace part of social life as they simply become a cool, and actually literally cool in the scorching heat of Suzhou in the summer, a cool place to hang out during the day. The temple is also filled with startling uses of space that exceed the Taoist rationalizing schemes. Incense heads have set up altars in the front halls of the temple and in the basement, and even in the storage closets and under the stairwells. There's one we call the Harry Potter altar because it's in the space under the stairwell where Harry Potter had to live. In most cases, they hold just exactly those small, shabby, dirty images from the original temples that the Taoists had rejected because their incense heads were capable enough and lucky enough to have saved those statues from the mass burial. In most cases, they also replicate the new, larger statues in the more officially controlled spaces in defiance of the policy that only one of each deity would be tolerated. The chief Taoist is not happy about this, but there's little he can do. Without the support of the incense heads, some of whom have hundreds of followers, no one at all would come to the temple. On the first and 15th of each lunar month, as well as on all the major holidays, the spirit mediums and incense heads congregate in the temple now, each heading to their own private altar or to the more official statues if they have no private altar. They hold court, healing, giving divine advice, mostly just hanging out with the throngs of people who come to burn incense. That is, the rhythms of the moon and of the rituals coincide once again. To some extent, even the destroyed villages are brought back to life on these occasions as people gather together in front of their old gods. This was a completely unintended consequence of the urbanization and even of the temple construction. But it shows the process of creating social worlds anew by pulling the silence of loss into the rhythms of a ritual life. Let me give just one example of this transition. One of the unofficial spirit medium altars in the temple's basement holds an unusual statue to a deity called Scholar Wang, Wang Xiuzai. Even that title, Xiuzai, scholar, it's very unusual for a deity. Xiuzai meant the holder of the lowest civil service degree in the old imperial system. That's not nearly a glorious enough title for a god. Stranger still, the statue had a short haircut that is not a Qing Dynasty haircut. It had a short haircut and wears the modernized Chinese clothing that was popular in the 1920s, when Xiuzai was no longer an official status. He holds a book, and his medium says he especially helps accountants. <laughs> He's a bit larger than the more famous deities with whom he shares an altar. As the spirit medium, Shi was her name, as, as, as Auntie Shi explained, scholar Wang was neither an imperial degree holder nor a man of the Republican era. He was a dead little boy. He drowned in a village pond in the 1950s. Older people still remember him. His sisters are still alive. Like so many of the dead, he had lain quietly in the, in the 60 years since he died. In all that time, his spirit was silent and his loss was felt mainly by his family. Yet the bulldozers had even upset those things had, that had already been buried quietly away. 
In fact, the entire region has experienced a wave of hauntings where spirits of the silent dead suddenly begin to make people ill because their resting places have been destroyed. In scholar Wang's case, he appeared to Shi, the spirit medium of his destroyed village, demanding worship. It was he who announced his proper title, he who described the clothing he should wear, he who defined himself as a deity for accountants. And so, at every new moon and at every full moon, people now gather in front of his altar, offer their respects with incense, make their wishes, and sometimes speak with him directly through the medium. Not every buried loss can rejoin the social world, but scholar Wang certainly has, and to some extent, he stands in for all those silenced lives and relationships that help create a new dialogue between sound and silence by letting longing have a rhythm. At the same time, however, by materializing scholar Wang with his short hair, Republican era dress, and Qing Dynasty title, and by narrating him as a god of accountants, the medium has completely transformed the little boy who once lived. Speaking always transforms silence. Only when pressed does she also explain that he was a drowned child, and thus invoke all those disturbed spirits. That is, when the spirit became a god, he conjured up not just a new image for himself, but also the silenced past of a drowned boy, of all the drowned children, of all those dead on the verge of the abyss. And now for the longing in rhythm. The longing never goes away. We yearn, at least until the loss is so complete that things have disappeared utterly into the abyss, as if they never were. For every scholar Wang, there are hundreds of others who never resurface. As I have suggested, rhythm is no escape from longing. It is instead a patterning for the longing, a way of learning to live together with the loss. In some ways, it creates the longing. People honor the spirits and hauntings of Chafang and Xietang and many other places because they cause and cure illness, bring good and ill fortune, facilitate and hinder people's hopes. That very process, however, rekindles and recreates their sense of yearning and absence. We can see one kind of example from an afternoon trip with Uncle Jin, an incense head who controls the most prominent of those unofficial altars in the temple. He's an older man who fared well in the compensation for the destruction of his house and farm, and whose adult children make good livings and help to support him and his wife, who has herself served the gods for decades as a spirit medium. He seems like a man happy with what old age has brought him, pleased at his nice apartment, satisfied with the prestige of his altar. He is the son, as they put it, uh, of Sui Liang Wang, the main deity in the new temple meaning that he serves the god as an incense head. Even he, however, feels the loss. Knowing we had a car available one day, he happily told us that Sui Yang Wang's grave still survived, and he offered to take us there. We drove, and we drove, and we drove, as he scouted around at the window of our car for the spot. He was clearly a bit taken aback by the new layout of the streets, which were, of course, utterly unlike what he grew up with. Finally, he had us pull up to an abandoned lot. He was sure this was the right place, but there was no grave. There were only the remnants of offerings usually used in exorcisms of haunted spirits, indicating at least some kind of power to the place. The spot was just over the line that used to separate Chafang from Xietang. This deity was primarily worshipped only in Chafang, but the grave was in Xietang. Reflecting the antipathy that Chafang people often expressed, he said, Ah, oh, those damn Xietang people. They don't even know what's important. Accepting that his deity's grave was lost, he soon cheered up again and offered to take us, still in the car, to see the original temple to Sui Liang Wang, which he said still stood in the town center of what had once been Chafang Township. This old town was at the very edge of the expansion of the SIP, when we went there together in 2016, it had a post-apocalyptic look, with some buildings reduced to rubble, others with their reusable bits like windows torn out, and some others with people still living in them. 
we walked endlessly through the desolation, no temple. Qin was silent as we drove him back to his apartment. Sui Liang Wang, of course, he had this huge new Taoist temple, far more elaborate than what stood before. And Qin had his own thriving altar there as well. Yet the rhythms of the new altar did not make the sense of loss go away. Instead, they made it possible to create a new life while still yearning for the buried world. Anti Li was another incense head, also for Sui Yang Wang, the same deity that Jin served. But she had roots in a different village temple. She also controlled desirable informal space in the new temple and was highly respected as a spirit medium, although she'd been slowed recently by her advanced age. Interviewing her one day in her garage, altar, whatever you call it, my co-researcher, Ka Peng Wu, and I were asking about the transition to the new temple. We asked her what had happened to all those statues, gods, that the Taoists had replaced with new statues. It's a pressing problem, because such statues are not representations of gods. They're not wooden symbols of divine beings. They are materializations of the deity, endowed with their own kind of life. And Auntie Lee, she brought her voice down very low, almost a whisper. She leaned over toward Kaping. I can't tell you, she said, looking very unhappy. She paused, and then she said, if I tell you, you'll have to dig them up. And after a further pause, she broke that self-imposed silence. She described how the Taoists had just dumped all those hundreds of materialized gods into an unmarked mass grave. The statues from her old village temple were buried there as well. She only has photographs of them on her altars in the new temple and in her garage. The Taoists claimed to have done a ritual, she said. But it was the middle of the night. Who knew? And even if there was a ritual, it was useless. She knows this. She knows it with certainty because she is with those gods. She is those gods sometimes. She described how they shiver in winter as the cold rains soak into them, how they bake in the summer under the brutal sun. She described their claustrophobia as they lie trapped with the dirt pressing against their faces, creeping into their nostrils. It's an interesting silence. Lee cannot speak of these gods' statues, and yet she does. I understand her, I can't tell you, to mean not that the information is secret or forbidden somehow, but that knowing the suffering of the lost gods, and by extension of the entire lost world of Lee's first 70 years of life, would be more than we could bear. To speak of it is to bring suffering. Breaking the silence only solidifies the, unspe the unspeakability of the loss. Given that the problem has no solution, better to stay silent. And yet, she speaks anyway. Li was more explicit about this than Shi or Jin had been. But all three really did the same thing. Shi, remember, presented scholar Wang as a deity for accountants, whose statue appears as an adult of some learning. And yet, she also told us how he was a drowned boy. Jin has proudly recreated village rituals and images of Sui Dai Wang under the noses of the Taoists in the temple. But he also yearns for the grave and the old temple that he knows has fallen to the bulldozers. By embracing one narrative, in all three cases involving the successful colonization of space in the new temple, each of these incense heads cannot help pointing as well to the silenced past of loss. That is, all three speak, speak in the broad sense of carving images and carrying out rituals, as well as narrating stories. In doing so, however, they're not attempting to end the silence, the absence, or the longing at all. Instead, this speaking recalls the silence for us. This speaking while respecting the silence is crucial because it begins to establish a rhythm, a dialogue between the unspeakable and the spoken. In spite of the yearning for the hopelessly lost 
that we see in the stories of these three spirit mediums, each of them has in fact been, been among the most important leaders in the creation of new rhythms through the construction of unofficial altars, squatter settlements of a sort, inside and beyond the new temple. Each has led annual pilgrimages to regional temples. Each has allowed periodic rituals to occur again in the temple. And so the final section, which I call endings. This essay began by suggesting that it would be useful to distinguish, to distinguish two broad sorts of silence. One is the silence of loss, longing, and yearning, where the abyss threatens to swallow everything. The other is the silence that makes rhythm possible. By now, it should be clear, though, that these two forms are intimately intertwined. Rhythmic repetition itself evokes the silences of longing, which in turn engender the rhythms of continuing time. We saw this each time someone avoided telling a story and then told it anyway, from K to the three spirit mediums. Rumi's Here Am I suggested that the rhythms of invocation and unspoken response could resolve the problem of the silence of God. As people reinvented social life after the bulldozers buried everything, I've tried to suggest that a similar process is occurring in Suzhou. Through the appearance of activated ghosts and new altars in garages and under temple staircases. These are not reestablishments of the rhythms of the 1990s or any earlier time, although they certainly have resemblances to earlier practices. They do, however, provide a framework for living with the silences entailed by the loss of past lives and social worlds. That is, we can see here a specific mechanism of the kind that Kidron and England document as a silent alternative to the logocentric healing usually prescribed in times of disorienting or cataclysmic change. One of the most important features of such rhythm is that it creates time. As predictable repetition, rhythm rests on a past and defines a future. The SIP's repertoire of revived and revised rituals is, of course, not entirely the same as what went on in the recent past of the 1990s. That would be impossible without the villages and their original temples. Nevertheless, both the deities and the ritual calendar are recognizably similar, allowing for a feeling of continuity. Perhaps even more important is the way that rhythm also looks forward to a shared future offering some kind of feeling of security in a world that has been thoroughly shaken. Silence here is never a lack, never simply the absence of speech that the logocentric paradigm sees as a problem. It comprises its own rich world of hopes and yearnings, some unsayable, others unthinkable. It's never simply non-speech, nor can it ever be reduced to speech. Translating silence to speech inevitably does it an injustice by simplifying its polymorphous character. Suto's new rhythms and rituals thus do not resolve the silences or make the losses any less real. Even Auntie Lee's I can't tell you and her ensuing description was not so much a translation of silence into speech as an invocation of the silence. As I tried to suggest with Billie Holiday, there is longing between every beat. Rhythm in what used to be Chaofang and Xiatang thus embraces silence without resolving it. Shi recalls a drowned child. Jin misses his god's old temple and tomb. And Li feels the suffering of the god's statues in her own body, even as each of them has been active in creating new rhythms. Here am I, speaks in these cases, not just for the silent answer to prayer, but for all those spirits who now haunt us because their graves have been destroyed, all those temples whose gods suffer beneath the ground, all those social relationships severed by the destruction of villages, all those stories that will now never be told. Kay's original story initially left those six heartbeats untold, although she eventually pulled them out of their silence. The rest of the patient, however, including his name, remains untold to any of us. The surgeon's story is not so different from the spirit medium Lee's I can't tell you, 
followed by an eventual narration of the suffering of the materialized statues, gods. Shi Jinanli left countless stories untold by their choices of what to tell. So does this essay, or any work of anthropology, in its choice of stories, in its inevitable silences. Even as all of us try to establish and contribute to the rhythms that let us operate on the next patient, or deal with a haunted client, or add to the anthropological conversation, we do so only in counterpoint with silence. If we do it well, like Auntie Lee, the telling conjures the silence rather than erasing it, just as the silence had conjured the telling. After the surgery on the unnamed man's bullet-riven heart, Kay was completely covered in blood. The blood had kept rush gushing out. She needed to go down the hall to the showers to clean off his blood and her sweat. She couldn't go through a public area so covered in gore, so she pulled on a disposable white bunny suit, they call them, over her ruined scrubs, zipping up from shin to hood. Nothing could be done about her sneakers, though. Every step squished a fresh, sticky red print onto the floor. A member of the staff followed behind, bucket and mop in hand, wiping away the last remnants of a life, one footprint at a time. With that mop went everything that we cannot know or will not tell about his life. Still, everyone, hospital staff and mourning kin in their different ways, would eventually establish new rhythms, always a bit different from the old ones, always telling stories and leaving stories untold. Even death is not always an abyss. As long as we respect their silences, the nameless man has not fully disappeared, along with Kay's footprints. The drowned boy can still become a god, and the buried gods can still whisper, there, here am I. The loss and longing remain in the repeated silences, but the world can move on, pacing out its new tempo. Thank you.